and welcome back to another episode of We Making It Woo. This is a weekly conversation of access to success so we can all what? Progress. If you want to know what success looks like in your 20s, just keep listening. As always, if you want to be a part of the conversation, email me. I didn't give you my email in the last episode. I realized it like last night. So it's Katie, why? Because that's my name. Smiles, because what? My smile is adorable. Dot NYC, because that's where we at. What happened last night? Oh my gosh, guys, I have to tell you what happened. So I am going through transitions. I've said that a thousand times in the last couple episodes. That's where I'm at. Uh, But one of the transitions that I'm trying to move through is... Standing in my power when people, when things maybe don't feel like I'm standing in my power. So last night I got in trouble at work because I did not turn the stereo up, but he had, my boss had not explained to me what was up. And so I did not take responsibility for such actions. And he proceeded to say, I don't want to hear that. And I had to pause and say, okay, that's not how we talk to people. It, it went back and forth, but I bring it up because guys, I was so scared. I was like shitting bricks because I thought, oh, my gosh, Khadija, girl, you ain't got no other job. You about to get fired. Um, I was also thinking like um, like if you are emotionally I don't identify someone that's emotionally intelligent always. I feel like I'm much more objective. But I think as I go through these transitions, I'm trying to become more emotionally um, smart or educated or whatever what I just used. But the. The way to do that is actually like honor where you're feeling and maybe learn how to like express them. And given that it's not a practice that I've been in for the last 20 something years, um, it was a little difficult. I was really, really um, nervous and scared. I re- talked about fight or flight. I was ready to bounce. So I say that to say uh, that's what happened last night. It was really, really huge. Um, I'm still kind of just like dissecting it for myself. But for anybody out there that is trying to like stand in their power, it is scary. But if you just try it and then, you know, talk to yourself about it. I had a long conversation with myself about it. How did it go? What are things we can do differently next time? (laughs) Uh, Just uh, do the best that you can and know that as you move through it, it just it's just it's different. What am I reading? Like I said in the last episode, I just finished reading Woman of Color by LaTanya Yvette. Honey, you did a great job with that memoir. It was visually stunning, super inspiring in terms of style, and I'm happy about it. If you can't tell, I'm excited about our special guest. But wait, special guest, what are you reading? I am reading uh, the book called Reviving the Tribe, uh, Regenerating Gay Men's Sexuality and Culture in the Ongoing Epidemic by the late Eric Rothfuss. Um, what's it about? Um, it's basically looking at how HIV interrupted uh, what was then sort of a revolution around how uh, gay men and intimacy and sexuality and community was progressing. So uh, wow. what we can relearn um, about where we were actually going before AIDS became uh, this sort of uh, how we organized. Uh, so what was life like before AIDS came along for gay men right. and how we can sort of get back to that place? We are definitely going to talk about that. Um, That's... Yes. So it is Pride Month. Um for those who don't know or haven't heard, uh, I did lose my great grandmother this month, so I did have fewer episodes. But I'll have you know that all the episodes have some notion of pride. Growing up, I did not celebrate pride. Growing up, I did not even know pride was a thing. Um, and so I really just wanted to take some time to not only educate myself, educate the people that listen, and also just like honor all the notions of pride as a way to just create access to the conversation because it's so necessary. Um, There is a woman, trans woman, that recently passed, I think this week. What is her name? It starts with an L. I want to get it right. At Rikers? uh, I think so. It was was a case. She was found dead in Rikers? Yes. I don't remember her name. I'm going to look it up right now. Shout out to Jules. Jules, I don't even know how to say your last name. But... Her name is Laylene Polanco Extravaganza. Um, obviously, like, I don't read the news as much as I probably should, partially because I'm a little sensitive booger and I can only take so much death. But um, 
I am really aware of what it means to lose a life, especially this particular month, and how that is um, even weighted even more when it comes to trans women of color is devastating in so many ways. So rest in power, rest in love, rest in peace, um, and also, like, condolences to those, that larger community, because I am learning that, like, death not only is this one person, but it's, like, a, a ripple effect. So peace and love and blessings. So... Yes. I met my special guest through Leap. Shout out to Leap. Uh, I had to get training and I also just was like really short on cash at the time. So I was like, oh, education and money winning. So special guest, can you introduce yourself? Uh, Yes. Thank you for having me first. Yes, Uh, of course. My name is Bryson Rose and I am the director of this on the, at the Center for LGBTQ Youth Advocacy and Capacity Building at the Hetrick Barn Institute. Hey, now. Okay, so guys, I was doing this training. What is my training certification? It is Youth Program Spaces, Safe Youth Program Spaces for LGB, because it was split. Yep, so there was uh, Safer Spaces for LGBTQ Young People. You did both of them, so. Yes. You had the whole shebang. A whole shebang. What I loved about Bryson, first of all, he's black. Sorry, like, <laughs> just like be honest. And you were from the South. Oh, Midwest, but Southern, Mid- South, Southern I influence. feel like Midwest folks, y'all are mm-hmm. like really close to Southern people. I feel like y'all had skating <laughs> rings. Oh, I yeah. Feel like, lock in, skating see, rings. Yeah. Lock in. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we can speak a, a language yeah. and somehow we're on the same page, even though we are literally miles yes. and miles yes. away from each other. Um, and I just thought you had such a. You gave the information in such a way that, like, offered a lot of access. Not to say that the other facilitator didn't, but, like, yeah. I just really liked the way you did it, too. Okay. So, Thank you. of course, that's why I reached out. Um, as I was saying previously, I did not know what Pride was. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I what was so, like, profound at the training was create it was like literally at the beginning it was like how many historical queer figures can you name and i was like uh well because you said they couldn't they couldn't be dead i was like because i only know El- i know ellen i know lena way no, they, no they yeah they 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 it would be better if they were if they had deceased right so that, yeah, yeah. and and that literally shook my brain because yeah. i love history yeah but so i couldn't what do people do you know, if you if you're a people without a history, you don't have a future. Right. So you know, it's important for us to call up ancestors and transcestors yeah. who have been a part of our lineage and are part of our cultural upbringing. Yeah, in in a way that because we were talking about this uh, in the last episode, in a way that's um, almost laissez faire. Like you don't even think about it. Like the same way that you can name the fifty presidents, you can name someone that is in the LGBTQ family and they are dead. Like the it's the 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 opportunity to just be, the opportunity for it to be as commonplace as anything else. Right. I mean, you know, so Bayard Rustin organizing the March on Washington, right. uh, his queerness right. is important to that story because of how uh, you know, A. Philip Randolph and uh, Abernathy uh, sort of looked at him and his leadership capability. Right. Um, so that, you know, it is important, but he also did something amazing. I mean, that's where Dr. King gave his uh, most right. famous speech. Uh, and this this place was organized by... And so many people look at that moment as, like, such a pivotal moment in history, exactly. and it was organized by... An openly gay black Quaker, the anti-war. And, and again, right, so and when we get peel back these layers of who he was... It, it isn't just that he was gay, right? He right. was anti-war. He was a Quaker. Uh, he was in, you know, he had been arrested right. for having a, what they were called gay sex then, right? Right, uh, so right, right. So this is a right. person who um, was defying these or- systems of orders. And right. that's really what it really means to be, uh, I'll say, queer rather yeah. than LGBTQ, is to look at all these systems um, right. and say, how are they causing harm? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's such a... I don't know. I just I love the way you phrase that. So I want to go backwards a bit. So usually with my interviews, I do talk about people's personal experiences and that may get there. Okay. But my uncle, uh, Anthony Sanders, may you rest so lovingly. There was my family doesn't listen to the podcast, but there was a rumor (laughs) when I was a kid that um, Uncle Ant might be gay because we called him Ant. Uncle Ant might be gay. And I was like, 
maybe, but whatever. But then these series of events started to happen, mm-hmm. one of which he passed of AIDS. Okay. And so I really do, first of all, want to talk about where was intimacy post, well, uh, prior to AIDS. Because I want to say, like, it was a rumor that he was gay. And I don't even know how he got AIDS. So what is it, I think a lot about, like, what does it mean to not have information and have to color someone's story? Especially when growing up where we were, like, I asked my my nana, which is the sister about it. And they said if he would have come out, they would have beat him to death. Mm-hmm. And so you have these like rumors, and like my aunt, my my nana, for example, won't listen to Luther Vandross because she thought he was gay. And then I moved to New York City, and then met people like, "Girl, he was so gay!" Like he so came gay. came to the parties, <laughs> like <laughs> what? Yeah, he was very gay. Mm-hmm. And so even if you have like these larger structures that don't that are clearly homophobic, but then how your history changes and like how that affects intimacy. So I just want to. That's where I'm. That's where I'm understanding it. Yeah, I'm also a huge fan of Pose, and that's a huge conversation too. Mm-hmm. But yeah, tell me about what did intimacy look like before and how. So I wasn't born then. Just, <laughs> just <laughs> no, FYI. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, but I would say reading the works of Essex Hemphill and Marlon Riggs and Joseph Beam, um, these are black gay men mm-hmm. um, who wrote about. Uh, what, how they organized, how they loved, how they lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are all men who succumb, um, I think, uh, don't quote me, but I think also come to HIV AIDS related illnesses mm-hmm. um, who were openly black, openly queer um, during the 80s and right. the late 90s, right? In Philadelphia and other places, uh, teaching at Howard. And um, and so, I mean, from their work, right? Um, mm-hmm. This is not my area of expertise. From, from their work, it was communal. It was, Mm -hmm. there's this sense of shared uh, multiple identities, right? So being someone who is not only gay, Mm -hmm. but also black, but also male. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there were writers, there were poets, there were filmmakers, uh, so artists, right? Yeah. So I think that I I can assume from reading some of their work um, that how they really found intimacy and love and connection was through their lived experience with each other. Right. Right. reading each other's work, watching each other's work, critiquing each other's work, right. being in community with other folks. Um, no different than now, except for we live in this very late stage of capitalism where everything is commodified. Right. Um, so I think prior to that, uh, you had a real deep connection and sense of uh, investment in each other. Um, mm. you know, they wrote letters to each other, right? And so I think that's where it existed. Yeah. Um, and I think now we are in this heightened sense of uh, hyper-visibility. Mm-hmm. And I think that people often assume that because you're hyper-visible, that means you're safe, that means that you are connected, that means that you have this life, that means you've arrived. Right. And I want to caution folks to think about hyper-visibility hyper-visibility happens in the context of, of capitalism. So mm-hmm. there are folks who are doing and organizing work who um, who I've known I've seen on TV and documentaries who right. are homeless, wow, you know like who who are at the HRC gala one day and then at HMI accessing pantry right because uh, that's how the system is set up right. So I, I want us to caution us that um, the Janet Mox, the Lavernes, um, uh, my uncle Teak Milan, who I love to dash out to Teak Milan, <laughs> Milan. Um, oh, I'm a huge, yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, you know, they will tell you uh, that they are really blessed and lucky because there are so many folks who are doing this work who don't have right. access. Who also, if you know them, I don't know if you know them personally, but I just very well. I and it's so funny. So when I met my now girlfriend, mm-hmm. I just thought she was so cute. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go on a tangent and then go okay. find my way back to Teak uh, and Kim. I thought she was super cute. Well, we could just backtrack a bit. So I didn't think that I was queer at all. But that then I, and I bring that up because when I got to college, I had a long time. I did the thing that you're supposed to do, at least where we are from. Like you date this person from high school, you go to college and even at A&M, you have a ring by spring. So you get your Aggie ring at 90 hours, and you're supposed to be engaged by 120. So it'd be like the first spring. Oh, wow. Your junior year spring, you should have an Aggie ring, and then your senior year spring, you should have an engagement ring. 
I got my Aggie ring, but I did not get the engagement ring. And it was a we. I was coming up on my junior year, and I was finishing, and I my ex was just like giving me the blues, and I think I had just gotten to a point where I was like, yeah, I think I should just try girls, you know, because I really it's not working. I'm very logical. I'm Capricorn. I'm like. You know, birds got five fish, got to swim. I meet a lot of women. All I got to do is figure out what to do, and I'll figure it out. You know, <laughs> I'm quite capable. <laughs> and so, lo and behold, these girls started presenting themselves to me, and they were so smart. Like, no offense, because not sex. I mean, this is going to sound sexist, and I'm sorry, but in my experience, the girls that I knew, especially in college, these girls were brilliant i knew a girl that was trying to group for the peace corps i knew girls that spoke multiple languages i knew girls that were like getting at the time anatomy and fizz was like the highest course i knew girls that made a's okay i knew <laughs> girls that was like just like i was like oh my god like i want to make babies like i definitely want to make a baby with you you literally have skills that i don't even have right. there was such a <laughs> there was such a like an awe about that i was like wow like women are delightful so i decided to make a list of all the girls that i would reach out to and just in case i became gay <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> lo and behold so I, I i bring all this up when i met my girlfriend at the time i just thought she was so cute and i asked her to be my number four girl boo yes because i'd already made a list and she was just number have to be number four and i was like look i have this list you want to be on it I'll reach out to you if this happens. It's just like, this is how I'm, this is how I'm, this how I'm processing it in my brain. <laughs> but then I actually really started to like her. And that's when shit hit the fan. Okay. Because I had no idea what to like, what to say, what to do. I was Googling a lot of things, finding flow charts. It was <laughs> nuts. Very lesbianic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was going to, but leading back to Tik and their Tik and Kim, their TED Talk about queer yeah. love literally was one of the most grounding, reassuring. Yeah. Like, I listened to that TED Talk. I'd actually probably listen to it to this day. I listened to it, like, three different times on three different occasions. It literally shook. It made everything that I was, like, really questioning at the time. It made it feel valid. It made it feel supported. So, I don't think like, you have to tell them. I will. They're the bomb. Like, they really, really um, talk about, like, representation matters. And I was going through a lot of transitions at the time. But what they said just um, touched me in such a sweet way so that. Uh, I will will relay the message. Yes. It literally made the hugest difference. But I I also wanted to, to, to say that, like, what is it? With photographs, you have to put them in a dark room in order for them to develop. And then you can show them. And sometimes, and I've been trying to think about visibility in that way too. Like sometimes darkness is actually necessary to mm-hmm. create a certain product. Mm-hmm. And so, if you can think about visibility in that way, do you need darkness as a way to? And something I think is also really important, and, and this is something that I am very passionate about. So I may go on a tangent. So do you just think? Pull, pull me back. <laughs> but there's this notion that people have to present themselves or show up fully arrived or right. fully realized. Right. And that is just not can I catch on the show? Yeah, I that's curse. not fucking realistic. <laughs> right? Like I am not gonna show up to a talk and say, you know, I embody this body liberation politic where I believe that all bodies are valid, right. deserve autonomy and pleasure and safety and uh, autonomy what i can say is i believe that right. and for my own self i struggle in around acceptance with my own body because since i was five people had expectations around my body right. that were not my own right. and so i'm doing some deep work and trying to figure that out so no i don't necessarily embody that practice yet but i believe it in something i'm striving for right. towards. rather than i uh, am well get up there and say you know i love my body i don't I do not love my body, but I don't have to love my body to show it care. Oh wow! I don't have to. Sh- I don't have to love my body to take care of it, right? Right, right. And I think that there's something about um, the way that we want people to show up, right, with all of the answers and these, right. you know, quotable things. It's yes, like, I may, I may say some shit that you're like, I've heard that before. Great, because the more you hear from more people, maybe more right. you embody and believe it. Right, and so um, as someone who often daydreams, right, uh, <laughs> and I daydream with myself being thinner, right? right? The person I see 
it's not who I am now. Right. I can share that with you and say there are moments when my life looks better because I'm thinner. Right. And that's my own shit. I right. may never, ever be in a place where I can love my body or I, I, I feel comfortable shirtless or right. I feel comfortable doing certain things. But I can talk about it and say, this is my thing that I am working with. And this is how I'm doing some of the work. And right. this is who I'm giving some of my stuff to, like my therapist or my friends. Right? Mm-hmm. So I want people, you know, when I mentioned that around like people, the like visibility not being safety or right. having arrived is that also we need to quit looking for that from people. We need to right. quit looking to these people to say, you are it, or this mm-hmm. is it, or you are fully here. You look at people who you can relate to maybe their process mm-hmm. or their insight. Mm-hmm. But there are things about them that you may not agree with, that you may not know, that may differ from your experience, and that's right. okay. Right, right. Well, no, I totally agree. I mean, so much of, quick. I'm, I'm coming from a dancer's perspective, mm-hmm. so so much of your, or what I felt like at one time, um, pretty recently was that so much of my ability to be actualized was going to affect my pay. Mm. I need to be at this moment. And and I I mean, I'm a god on a limb. I don't know. But when I think about influencers, when I think about creatives as a commodifiable employment, a lot of it is like you have X amount of skills right now. It pays right now. So if you don't have that skill, you're not making money, in which is super capitalistic, right? Because what you're basically <laughs> saying is like, you need. It's all about the right now and how you can. It's like almost it's like the what is it like the endorphin high and like all I got to do is do this and then I'll get this and then I'll do this and I can get that. Um, yep. To an extent where I was like, oh, I don't even think I want to do this at all because like oh, wow. I'm not actualized. It's going to take me a minute. You won't pay me. So clearly I need to go start to look for other things. But as I transition, um, it's it's so difficult to be able to honor your own process and then try to find employment, specifically with artistry, where people can honor wherever you are in the process yeah. rather than pushing for this, like, oh, oh the leg is there. The other leg is like, oh, it's not there? Oh, we can't look at you until the leg's there. So, like... And I just imagine that for you as a dancer, as someone who's woman identified, as someone who's black, right? There are these expectations. Oh yeah. Of what what you will produce and what your process is like and what you yeah. look like and be, and that's the other side of this is that um, it's important that we are allowing uh, black folks to be in whatever way that looks. Right. right. You're from Texas. Right. You're in. <laughs> Uh, you live in Brooklyn, you're a dancer, you have a podcast, all those things inform who you are. Of course. Right? And so I need to let you have that Mm -hmm. uh, and not be expecting you to be somebody else. Right. You're not Lorian Gibson, right? Like, no. She's who she is and that's fine, right? Oh, yes. Yes. (laughs) I love Lorian. I love Boom Boom Cack, right? Like, (laughs) But that's not you, and that's okay. Right. Uh, there's. I look at white folks, and they have so many opportunities to just be. I always say, I know in films, I'm a buddy, budding screenwriter, and I would say, uh, I will know that we've gotten to a place where there's more equity in our uh, media portrayals when – I can make a movie, a sequel to 27 Dresses called 28 Dresses, and I have Lupita, and it's not really that miraculous. It's just a cute little rom-com that you go see when you want to escape, um, and it grosses $70 million, right? It's just her right. running around being ridiculous in New York. Because everything doesn't have to be a slave narrative or have an overtly political message. Right. Sometimes I just want to be mundane <laughs> and and do that, because that's literally... Judd Apatow's, like, sort of thing, right? And right. Or Nora Ephron. Like, yes, there's something about what they're doing that's interesting, and we'll think about it later, but it's also. not, it's not, you know, like, I don't necessarily desire to do uh, a black, you know, an, or a, another Roots or another, right. like, some shit. I want to be, like, funny, and like, <laughs> and that's why I love Issa Rae so much, because... Um, because she's hilarious. Because she's hilarious, and I think that even when I don't, agree with some of the terms of our show, I can also just laugh, right? right. Like, I can tune in on Sunday, and I can just laugh. Right. And it's not this sort of, like... Deep. It's deep. not it's deep. It's not that deep. It's, it's not, not that, deep. that deep. Well, no, that makes me think about Girlfriends, which I was way too young to watch, by the way, but it was a great My show. Girl, That was the... But <laughs> at the time, and it's, so, and it's so funny how things work out, at the time, I'd watched it 
up until like from the very beginning. I remember when Joan and um, what's the guy's name? They're writing phone sex? No. no. Oh, I remember that too. <laughs> <laughs> but later when Joan falls in love with the guy that also is at the, who's also a lawyer at her firm. They have been William. friends. Yes. Mm-hmm. When they fall in love and she's like standing in the mirror. I remember that was a huge the season finale. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Oh my gosh. And then Monica shows up and they're on the flight and they're going to maybe get back together. Ugh. Yeah. I was in it. Yeah. Fast forward, we moved, we got cable, and Sex in the City comes out. <sighs> dun, dun, dun. And just how they were basically the same story. And I'm also learning too, like I watched Living Single, and then, but now I think with Instagram and people talking more, and maybe I'm just paying attention more, Living Single is basically friends, but for black people. And just how they even when the stories could be potentially predominantly black, they don't gross as much. And it's literally the same thing. Maybe Sex and the City have more sex scenes. Sure. Great. But in terms of subject matter, in terms of content, in terms of like what the show is actually about, like right. it's literally the same story. Yeah, and, and I also think about it, too, in terms of what that show... So Girlfriends is the first time that I saw a black woman who was a bit insecure and neurotic, right? So Joan, being this lawyer, was not this... Um, she was not um, Tony, right? Oh, she so, wasn't so, Tony. She wasn't Maya, and she wasn't Lynn, right? Like, no. you know, uh, Joan is insecure, right? Yeah. Like, though she's this, you know you know, educated lawyer. A homeowner. homeowner. She she has moments of, you know, she's neurotic, right? And she has these moments of self-doubt. And Super it's the big time moments. I got to see that all these these girls were going to be different. Right. Um, you know, I saw an episode where, you know, uh, what's her name? Um, Lynn, Maya, Tony. Maya cheats on her husband. Right. Right. So right. You know, she has this longing for somebody else, right? And like right. um how that, you know, she t- talks about that in terms of like it was desire. Right. So it's like, you know, the show was just so um, you know, much so much more interesting uh than I think people gave her credit for because it was on a network that didn't necessarily have the biggest budget. Right. Um, but no different. You know, I like seeing shows like this. I don't necessarily always like watching a show. I feel like it's a it's a overtly political, or right? Heavy, right? You know, well, because as a kid, I wouldn't have got like. Well, <laughs> granted, <laughs> I didn't get <laughs> half of it anyway. Right, right, right. <laughs> but the stuff that I could latch on to, like I remember when Tony, um, Tony got married to Todd. First of all, I remember when Todd got. Tony that card and the little black girl was on it and she was and she came out of the bedroom like a day later like with an afro pick and a thing like is this what you want some like exoticized fetish of me and he wanted to be culturally sensitive I did not pick up on all those social cues but I remember that episode and I remember it was hilarious short white Jewish man tall black woman real estate boss bitch right like but or even things like you know, um, there's this really interesting dynamic with Lynn uh, Persia White, right, right, uh, and her white mother, right, and right. this sort of uh, what does it mean to sort of be black, and what does it mean to sort of have a parent who may not understand or be complicit right. in your own oppression, right, 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 um, as a white woman with a biracial black child, right. Um, I think those are all interesting. I think that the show that did it for me. Uh, black show rather uh, was Soul Food. I remember watching. Soul oh my Food. gosh, that was on what was that like HBO? Show, Showtime. It was on Showtime. I got. I would have gotten so much trouble. I remember <laughs> I watching it, known. and um, so I came from a divorced household. So my mom was just like, you know what? <laughs> I'm one of that you I, you, you're, you're gonna make it. You're, you'll be fine. But I remember watching one particular episode, and uh, Rockman Dunbar, who plays the dad. Which um, one? He's um. Max's husband? Max's husband. Right. He. Oh, yeah. They go through. Yeah. Well, he. So the episode, Ahmad goes to this really expensive private school. Right. I remember. And, you know, he tests in. He gets a scholarship. Right. The sister takes the test and she doesn't do nearly as well. She doesn't get in. So they're grappling with, like, how do we handle having a child who has a particular type of intelligence. Right. That afforded him this. Opportunity. Opportunity. 
uh, with our daughter who has to then go to public school, right? right. Because we can't afford right. to send her to another school where she doesn't have a test in. Uh, that to me was an interesting storyline. Even at thirteen, I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." Well, and because you—that's not something that you, you hear. That's not something you hear or you see. Exactly. And the other episode was Ahmad, who's the son, mm-hmm. um, ends up getting a mentor in the school, and he's like amazing. Oh, and this his sounds dad familiar. Finds out that the mentor's gay, and he has this moment right. where he's like, "I don't want this to bother me, but it, it does." does. Right. And so right. the episodes about them working, him working through, you know, uh, uh, Vanessa Williams, who plays the right, wife, right. they're working through this thing because, like, he he wants to real. be okay, but right. there's something about him that he's like, do I, you know, like, there's still something there about, like, this right. man's masculinity and his sort of sexuality and how that plays a role. Right. And those are things that I can feel like I can deal with on a show because mm-hmm. I think that they're a little more nuanced. I think right. sometimes I just don't want to be watching <laughs> Roots. You know what I mean? Like, and I love black history. Like, I was an African American studies major. Like, I always talk about race in my training. Right. You can't talk about gender and sexuality without talking about race. Right. And when I want to, like, laugh. <laughs> laugh or kiki, I also want it to be intra-communal. So there's certain things. I'm also tired of us talking about ourselves in relationship to white people, white structures. Right. There's some stuff that goes on in the community that's interesting, just a d- dynamic, right, around, you know, types of femininity. You know, you're from the South, right? You know, I deal every day I, I was I was go, the women here are so hard. <laughs> I'm just looking for, you know, and, and that's a gender, that's some gender shit that I have to deal with, right? Because I'm like, how are the women here so brick? Like, y'all cuss somebody out, y'all got on Jordans, y'all like, and I'm like, how do y'all date? Because, like, aren't these men looking for something a little bit more feminine? Or, you know, like, or maybe that's my own shit I'm projecting, right? So we all deal with it. It doesn't matter where I am in my journey around understanding this shit, like... I am in die. You know, like, it's just like, I come well, from a it's place... it's so yeah. right. Like, that's not... Like, that's not. That's not the case. Like, this is not the case. I remember my ex came, and he was just like, these these women sound like niggas. Like, what, what, what is happening? And I... I was so fascinated with, specifically in New York City, you know, I didn't grow up with my dad, and when my mom remarried, that marriage had to take a hiatus because he had to go on a vacation, we'll say. And um, so father presence was something that was um, just not, I just didn't see it as much as I saw like a motherly presence. Like mm-hmm. I, I knew folks' moms, like the back of my hand, folks' dads here or there. But when I moved here, interestingly enough, I see dads with their kids all the time i see dads with the um the little carrier that you sit mm-hmm. on your stomach mm-hmm. but it's it's a completely i was like amazed and i was like what is in the water up here the same way that the women are like try me <laughs> the dudes are like yeah i'm like stay at home dad and like like i do this thing and i was like what yeah i took a break from my career in banking to you know to like to take I- care of the child because my wife is you know an artist or, you know. Or, a boss. Yeah. Bo- you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm very comfortable not, like, that's there every day. And I'm just like. Yeah, so it's, it's Where interesting. Where do they do that at? Yeah, like, it's, 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 it's all complex, right? And so no different than my notions of blackness really shifted moving to first Binghamton, where I used to teach and work at the university, and having students who are mostly not African-American but black. Um, mm. And then moving to New York and, and really seeing people's, relationships to blackness look different because in Ohio, I don't know if this is true in Texas, but if I saw another black person, I'm going to say hello <laughs> because that's just how we are. Like, you know, particularly growing up in a predominantly white area, you just like, we see another black person. It's like, hey, it's a commu- it's a, yeah. I, I want to, you know, head now. What's going on, brother? How you doing, sister? Like, you know, good morning. And here it is just not bad. No. And so I've constantly have to go, okay, either I'm just going to speak first and not and be okay without a, you know, a without hello, a thing. Uh, response back. Or I'm going to start trying to uh, invoke that in some of the uh, young people I work with or, right. uh, you know, people that I know because it's different. But it's challenged me, right? It's challenged my sense of what does it mean to be black? Right. Um, and who gets authority on blackness? Right. Well, and I, we were talking about this, I think, a little bit before, and I've talked about this in a lot of, of the episodes. It is, not, I went to Texas A&M University. Come on, Aggies. 
it's not when I say it's not that deep, it totally could be, but it don't like it's not allowed to get that deep. Okay. Like I just remember when I first took like my first Africana studies class, I was that girl that was like I was known as like the angry girl. Well, because it, it was a new information. And so I hadn't been angry for the last 18 years. So, <laughs> you know, I might as well take my time and be angry now. Um, and and then, so you're dealing with this part of being angry. And A&M is, now that I'm a little bit older, I can kind of explain it the way that I think of it is. A&M is a school that has been praised for systemic racism, I think. Oh, wow. And and not like not in a like outright, oh, that's racist. Let me give you some money. But you have certain traditions. You have certain uh, status quos that the school it like that's what makes it a great school. And it just so happens that the things that make it like it's a school that's big on tradition. But most of your traditions were rooted in a past that you can't help but be racist. And so when you spend so much time honoring that past and remembering that past the way that you do, mm. it it just so happens to be racist. And so I can get angry all I want, but when we talk about, for example, there's a there's a Soul Ross statue, and it's right in front of the what is it, the Memorial Student Center, MSC? Yeah, MSC. And so when people are like, bring it down. Why am I going to argue? And, and, I, and I remember having to butt up against that. Like, I'm not going to argue with a brick wall. I'm not going to explain to you. I'm not going to go back and forth about rightness. You may think I'm wrong, and that's okay. But what we're not going to do is make me think I'm great. But, you, but when you have or when you go to such a huge institution like that, it's like you can be angry, but we're not, it's not a nuanced conversation. It's simple. Y'all make money off of this. You guys have created a legacy around this. So for for so for me to want to have a nuanced conversation, it's just like a conflict of interest. You don't want to have a conversation, I do. So it maybe it's best for me to leave. But then when I came to New York City, the only skill I had was basically like, oh, I don't like something. Oh, it's time for me to go. Whereas up here, oh, these is radical black folks. These is people that got like parks named after them and like their connection to history and anger and revolution and it's completely these is people that's about to start a war they're not about to start a war and, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and, and part of that too could also be about uh the ways in which like you know what people's feelings are what the outcome would be right so like, right you know what does it look like uh for us to take on the statue right like what's right you know, does that shift the ways in which black football players are treated at texas a and right what, you know like what's the you know what are what are we trying to see when you take things away what are we trying to replace it with right right, right. And i think those are some of the questions that people have may perhaps have to answer right uh, in those spaces it's like you know the statue comes down what comes in its place like, right what are, we, what are we actually building right so what are we building what are we hoping to challenge how do we reconcile a really troubled past yeah absolutely. with the current student body like because you know nm is a military school and that was predom- That was all male up until like basically like fifty years ago, or maybe now it's like a little bit like closer to sixty. But yeah, and how do you? What I loved to I think was uh, shout out to hashtag Be Heard, and we, there was a conversation around reparations at Brick, and they talked about how reparations also includes a rewriting of history, that includes more than just one voice and so how especially at a school like AM, how how do you do that is it in the like welcome during gigam week with all the freshmen is it a mandatory course that like like how does one change a history especially when your history precedes like your history is basically where your identity is and so yeah i think the i think those are questions that uh, people often wrestle with. So when I think about, um, which is why in our trainings, right, I yeah. talk about how uh, the term transgender may be 60 years old, but the experience of someone not identifying with the sex they're assigned at birth is as old as time. Right. So I can hear you and say, absolutely, this term may feel new or these terms may feel new. Right. Um, or they may not feel culturally relevant. That's fair. Right. But, but the experience, experience of people being attracted to people of the same sex and gender is not new. It's right. quite old. And part of rewriting history is also telling, speaking truth to power. So 
um, there's often, and this is something that I'm trying to really work through, there's often this um, idea that queer and trans is, is whiteness, right? So, right, Because right. the folks that are sort of lang- languaging. Right. These are people that sort of are, are at the top or they control the narratives around right. what it means. And I often go, that's not true, right? Like there are, there are indigenous communities around this world uh, that many of us come from who have had these experiences. Um, and so when we're talking about um, expanding our notions of gender, mm-hmm. expanding our notions of orientation and sexuality, we have to go back to those things, right? Mm-hmm. And so we have to talk about those things. That's the first thing. Mm-hmm. The second thing is we have to talk about how colonialism <laughs> Uh, and and <laughs> capitalism right. um, have created a very limited tropes of who you can be to have access right. to a livelihood. So right. an example I'll give has nothing to do with being LGBTQ. It has to do with performing your gender and your sexuality in a particular way mm-hmm. in heterosexuality. Mm-hmm. So do you know who Claudette Colvin is? Mm-mm. Claudette Colvin lives in the Bronx, mm-hmm. and she is a black woman. When she was 15 years old, she did not give up her seat on the bus when she was arrested. Mm-hmm. And this is predates Rosa Parks. Parks. But the reason why uh, Claudette Coleman's name is not as um, memorable, memorable or is known. because she was dark-skinned, she was 15, and she was an unwed mother. Right. And so she didn't embody the respectable... Right. Uh, respectability that a Rosa Parks, who was, you know, the secretary of the NAACP who investigated uh, the sexual assaults that were happening to black women across uh, the South, right. who was lighter skinned, who right. was older. Palatable. Right, who was, you know, who was palatable. And so what that does is it creates this notion of who is valued. Right. And so if it wasn't gay folks, it wasn't trans folks, it wasn't same gender loving or bisexual or queer folks, it would be unwed folks, it would be fat folks. It, right. like it, it's all connected because in the system, someone has to be marked to be killed. Right. Someone has to be marked for death in capitalism. Someone has to be marked for death in oppressive systems. So mm-hmm. if it is, if they come from, they're going to come for me at night, but they're going to come for you in the morning. Mm-hmm. So if, if all black folks left, right, and this is why black, like this is why Marcus Garvey's sort of go back to Africa never was successful because the powers that be wouldn't let it happen. Right. If black folks left this country, who then is marked for death? Poor white folks. Right. Right. Like you have to have. You have to have a bottom. You have to have a bottom. And so I think that there is a, a real reckoning that we have to have right. about the system we live in right. and why folks are so invested in creating these hierarchies based upon gender, sexuality, and race. Right, and right. Um, because the system's fucked up. Right. So if you the system, right. there would be no need. We're not in competition. There's, an, there's enough right. for all of us. Right, right. But so many people are conditioned to believe that there is only a certain amount. Right. And therefore, I can't be in the bottom. So therefore right. Be. And we've talked, at least I've tried to press upon that in different episodes. And also, too, like, I think that was a big reason why I created the podcast in the first place. I think I've talked about this in a couple of ways, but most I'm a big memoir person. I Mm -hmm. love memoirs. That's like the thing that I will mostly read. But usually when you read a memoir, the person trying to think of the youngest memoir I've read, I think was Misadventures of an Aqua Black Girl, which was Issa Rae. And Issa Rae is how old? Mid 30s. Right. She's not in her 20s. She tells me about her 20s, but... When she wrote that book, she was in her 30s. And that's the youngest. I'm sure there are other folks. Oh, you know what? Something of a Black Chef by Kwame. Last name I can't remember. I just read that. And I think he was in his 20s while he was writing. But I think he's like 28 now. Okay. But you go, or at least I felt like, I was going through some difficult transitions. And nobody was talking about what success looks like in your 20s. What success looks like now. When it's not palatable, when it's not self-actualized, when, you know, like Issa Rae's apartment got broken into and they stole all of her things. Yep. And there was this larger conversation around, like, is it time to move? What's meant for you? What's not for me? Or like Kwame, who lost his first restaurant. All these things happen. But that's why I created the podcast, because I wanted to know. I thought to myself, if I only see success as happening when I'm 30, what the hell am I doing right now? And and I also think that like seeing it as this thing that's not happening right now, it creates this like um, seed of lack. 
especially in then working with nonprofits too, you just walk around with a bunch of people that don't have. And then when they talk about what they don't have, they start laughing as if it's not real. And you think, I think I'm crazy because I'm like, nope. I know you know that we ain't got no money. And you, cause you just told me we ain't got no money and you laughing about it. Well, that's how that's, you know, so I think that the, the notions of uh, success um, are again, because the hyper visibility because right. of I have an Instagram. I didn't have Instagram for six years. I got back on it earlier this year. I've already regretted it. It's already something I might delete. I just I can't deal with it because there's such a um, projection of things. Mm-hmm. So um, I think success has to be something that people name for themselves. Right. So, you know, I work with young people who, uh, many of whom are marginally housed or homeless. Mm -hmm. And um, so for some of them, just to make it to HMI and be able to be around folks who are like them, Mm -hmm. um, but they can just sort of forget about not having Mm -hmm. whatever they don't have. Uh, could be a success for the day. Right. Um, being able to take a shower, be able right. to get a really good uh, plate of dinner. You know, maybe we have a, a guest chef for the day. And, you know, it, it could be that small. Right. Uh, we've had young people. I remember a young person. Uh, she's from Jackson, Mississippi. And I said, girl, how'd you get to HMI? You know, this is very early in my time at, at my job. And she said, you know, I Googled LGBTQ and youth and I saw HMI popped up. Now, right. uh you know, she had came out um, when she was about 15 or 16, mm-hmm. but she knew that she was trans. And, mm-hmm. But she knew that she couldn't, she knew that her family was okay with her being gay, but the idea of her actually being a trans woman, right, was just going to be too much for them. Right. So she Googled HMI and she bought a one way ticket. Damn. And she packed her entire life up. And she said to me, I left everything I've ever known to find freedom. That's real. She was 20 years old. Right. right, and so for her success, you know, she came to HMI. She was didn't have any place to live. She was, in, right. you know, um, couch surfing, and you know, she was in a shelter. Uh, and eventually, about two or three years, she was able to find housing. Right, um, and she just it just happens. She wants to be right. She she gets to be successful. So no, she's not living on you know the Upper West, and no, and she's you, not. In fact, like in those who don't who those who don't live here, you don't need to. <laughs> right. I hate live. I cannot live over there. <laughs> but she literally is a black trans woman from the South who decided that she was going to live in our truth, and she's able to do it here, and yeah. that's success for her. Yeah. And so for other folks, success could be. Um, it's just relative, and I think that there's right. such a unilateral expectation. Right. That I felt. And still fall and again. I'm not fully realized. So still fall uh, fall into today when I see people. Um, but the good thing about doing this work is that when you meet people and you know them, yeah, you start to realize that what's out there isn't the whole story. It's right. part of the story. Right, right, part right. Of the right. Story. It's definitely not fake. Right. But it's not the whole story. Right. And the whole story is actually what's fucking interesting. Right. You know, like that's why we memoirs. That's right. The whole story. You know, around. You know, the failures, right. the, the struggles, right. um, the moments of just like, oh, shit. <laughs> right. I didn't know. That's actually the interesting part because that's just life. Right. right? And I think that's, that's a again, that's why I, I was just going to finish my thought that like that's why the, I have the podcast. Y'all, these interviews can be long or they can be short, whatever. But it gives you an opportunity to access, especially with artists. That's a, the... With a vin- with a product, the the I feel like the claim and the like glamour and the awe is of the work, and I get it, I get it. But at the same time, like you were saying, it's interesting to know how you how you financed it. It's interesting to know like if you did if you lost some kind of like mental stability during this process, how did you get through it? Because the reality is, especially with dance, for example, a lot of times if you don't record it, it's just that moment in time, and that's it. So I feel like it's so much harder to hold on to that awe. Granted, it could be beautiful work, but it's so much harder to hold on to that awe versus like a conversation that I recorded for you <laughs> is available throughout. And you can really hear the total- much more of the totality than you're going to get in a proscenium the- theater. But even when you record something. So I went to go see the documentary on uh, Diana Ross's concert in Ooh. Central Park. So, And I'm watching it, right? Yeah. And but there's nothing like I'm sure 
when people are telling stories about it. So you hear Trace Dillis Ross talking about, you know, being behind stage. And right. Even if it's not, re- I mean, so it's recorded for us, right? So we're able to see her perform. It was broadcast. Right. But, like, the feel and the taste and the smell and the sense, like, that's where the, the that's where it lives. You know, so right. if you do a performance somewhere and it's just 20 people, there's 20 people in the world who were either, you know, moved or bored, or whatever they were by your yeah, performance. You know, right. I saw Prince in Madison Square Garden in 2010. And it was um, unreal. There's nothing I can describe, nothing about it that I can describe that will give you the essence of what it was like. And there are 30,000 other people who, <laughs> right, who have that moment who don't necessarily need to be documented because it changed us. Yeah. I think I can say, for, I can't speak for them. For me, it changed <laughs> my sense of what an artist is. I mean, right. that man did a 10 minute rendition of Do Me Baby, right? Like, and you know, he a witness. So this 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 is actually stepping out of his religious, you know, religiosity. You know, he a witness, you know, and got became a practicing one. He didn't had to be, what did they but, say? Yeah, then I had to lose my religion one time. He lost his religion, you know, because he was so caught up in the moment. And it's just like, that's what life is about. You know, going right. to to see something or experience something. And you just have the feeling, the memory, you know? Some yeah. things are good to record, you know, take a picture, you know, right. flag, your family, take right. a picture. Yeah. But like your first roller coaster ride, that's gonna live with you. Oh my gosh. Either, either yeah, you're gonna be like Lauren. my father rode a rag around, he was five years old. My father will be sixty this year. He has never been on anything else, including a plane. <laughs> so it stuck with him to where he's like, I ain't doing that shit ever again. And for my cousin, it was like <coughs> I became a roller coaster enthusiast. Like literally, I'm going to ride every roller coaster everywhere all the time. Because that first feeling, that's what lives with you. That's what that's what people want to hear and see. So that's amazing. Yeah, I yeah we uh, that yeah was, yeah that was amazing. <laughs> I still remember my first roller coaster ride. Okay, so we have a little bit more time. Okay, we have a little bit more time. What you want to know? I what do you want to tell me? I think is what I want to ask. Is there anything else that we haven't touched upon? I first of all want to say I love that we didn't talk about anything specifically. Oh, me too. This was good. This is... uh, but yeah, is there anything you want the people to know? You know, it's Pride Month. Um, I want folks um, to celebrate in the ways that make sense for them. Yeah. Um, but I also want us to always remember that uh, Pride was a riot. Um, Right. And that we have a duty to honor the legacy of the folks who were rioting against uh, the police um, intrusion upon a space where they could be safe and be themselves mm-hmm. um, by committing to learning more and, and growing deeper in our understandings of the diversity and complexity of sexuality and gender. Mm-hmm. And that means, you know, like I do in our trainings, like we're going to spend time thinking about what it means to us. Mm-hmm. I don't need you to wear a T-shirt. I mean, I need you to think about how you've been acculturated or socialized around these topics and what are ways that you either are perpetuating harm or liberation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, Pride Month can be this time of going to the march and it could be this time of going to the different borough, uh, you know, marches and all the things and tabling and um, partying. And that's part of it. Absolutely. Have its 50th anniversary of Stonewall. But Stonewall was a riot. Right. And and much of what uh, that movement was trying to to do uh, has been lost. Right. Uh, so listen to some of the ancestors um, and listen to some of the elders in the community talk about what the desire was. I think we need to get back to that. Right. Um, so what does it mean uh, in a world where you know trans women are being black trans women are being murdered um, at such a high rate? Uh, right. You know either by the state or by you know, interpersonal violence. Right. What does it mean for um, you know, there was a lesbian couple in the UK who these men asked them to kiss for them. And they were like, we're not a fucking show. And they beat them up. And they bloody, you know, what is it? What are we actually learning about right. uh, the complexity of sexuality and gender? Right. Um, if we're just trying to categorize people, right? Like, right. what are we learning about the the beauty, the beauty and the diversity. What are we learning about in terms of how systems are oppressing people? You right. Know? Um, so pride should be a time of reflection, uh, and joy, and celebration, and right. also remembrance. Um, but but I want folks to commit uh, this year um, in the 50th anniversary of Stonewall uh, to think about how 
pride is about liberation and liberating right. ourselves from these systems. Right, right. No, and there was one last thing that I wanted mm-hmm. to say too. There was this guy. Um, there's this guy in church. His name is Brother Ray. Brother Ray sang in the choir. Mm-hmm. Brother Ray was our masculine presenting. I I thought like he always wore like the nice little uh, collarless uh, kind of a blousey dress shirt with slacks. Um, but it was pretty well known that Brother Ray was gay, but nobody said anything. And um, I recently found out that one of our pastors, when I was really little, I was like, I think I could have been like before pre-K, but he was such a nice guy. I just remember him being so sweet to me. And I and as I've grown up and having to like explicitly explain to my mom that I date a woman now, and I recently told the pastor that baptized me in so many words that I was also dating women. And um just that um clash of like my pastor at the time he in that moment was like, I still love you, baby, I'ma go. But then he called my mom. And they had a different conversation. And I, at least in my experience, I found these like these little tropes that like old black men can be gay in church. You just don't have to say anything about it. Or you, uh, we, uh, we had this dude in our neighborhood. I was really little. I think his name was Lana Ray. Lana Ray was like here for the gods, and nobody said anything except when Lana Ray tried to holler at somebody's boyfriend, and that's when violence mm. was okay. And so how these um, very clear organized structures have a code of conduct that we exist in in a way that you're not supposed to question, even if they're like, clearly, this person can be acknowledged in totality. Like, you don't have to ignore this part. You don't have to play it up and like, let let the world know. But how can that person, again, like we've been saying, it just be normal. Yeah. Laugh, kiki, human. It's all good, and we also in a, in a. I think we also. I, I'll say I sometimes have to check myself in thinking about uh, the ways in which I assume or presume right. uh, that cis hetero folks are not also struggling with their sexuality and orientation. Mm-hmm. Because um, when I think about church <laughs> and I think about uh, these structures, how many of these folks are having extramarital affairs, right. or who have. Um, shame around attraction to other people who are not their spouses. I mean, right. le- deep shame, right? right. Which, which le- leads to secret behavior, right? Right, like, right. Um, like these people are not like like the idea that like because they're cis and hetero, they have these like lives that are right. like, like there's so much that they're carrying, right? And so right. I think that black sexuality in this country has been so demonized, right, uh, and so pathologized. I mean, we are the only people who have a governmental report about how our uh, wanton sexual behavior leads to our own demise, right? That's the Patrick Monahan report. Um, mm. And so, you know, we are, you know, marijuana in this country became illegal because William Randolph Hearst didn't want hemp industry, you know, threatening his uh, industry, right? Producing paper and, and things like that. Right. And so the movie Reefer Madness was created, and Reefer Madness basically says black men are high, they'll rape white women. Right? So, like, the marijuana legalization rests upon this film called Reefer Madness. Right. Right? So, like, black sexuality in this country is so shamed mm-hmm. and so pathologized that um, it, it's no wonder, right, folks right. who also are feeling something, it's easy to look at the LGBTQ folks and who are black like, and like, uh-uh, because they also, and how many black boys and men play up into uh, stereotypes around the type of sexuality black men have? Like, how many right. people, how many black folks are actually reclaiming their bodies from dominant narratives, um, from any structure? Right. And so we have a lot of work to do just in terms of, depathologizing what it means to be black and be sexual and have a body. Right. You know? In a fun way. You think, like... In a fun, in a Like, let's totally make out and not... And just because of your own volition. Like, to move with your own body without this larger... Exactly. So, as always, I want you to make it live. I want you to make it breathe. Per Bryson, I think it might be time to take some moments of reflection. But as always, I just want you to make it. Bye, guys. You say bye, too. Bye. That was just so fun.